the world. Match week 25 in the Premier League is here. And over the next hour, we will look ahead to the action, including a super Saturday with all three title contenders playing on the same day. Friday nights are Team Talks nights. Welcome to the show. One of West Ham's best ever players back on his old turf, plotting Arsenal's success. An historic victory. A cataclysmic defeat. Delivery. That could be the winning goal! It's Haaland! Brantwaite brushed aside, and Erling Haaland wins the game for the champions. Haaland across looking for Tony, who scores again. Souza drives it through! Oh! Wow! Kicked his balance, and absolutely wraps it up. Went tough for Palace. Chelsea fast and furious at the end. There is football every single day from Saturday through to Wednesday in the Premier League. On Saturday, it all gets underway at the GTEC Community Stadium when Brentford hosts table-topping Liverpool. A host of matches kicking off at 3pm here in the UK, including Tottenham's clash with Wolves and then the big one at the Etihad, Manchester City and Chelsea doing battle. On Sunday, two matches to look forward to, including the late one, Luton at home against Man United. Monday night, it's Everton against Crystal Palace. Man City in action again on Tuesday. They take on Brentford and then Liverpool. Starting it and ending it off as well, they take on Luton at Anfield at 7.30 here in the UK. Let's look at the Premier League table because Liverpool are top. Two points clear, they play early, they have a chance to make it five. Man City and Arsenal all in action on Saturday as well. Tottenham are two and they are in the top four. Aston Villa in fifth position, Manchester United in sixth and Chelsea bringing up the top ten on 34 points. It's all close at the top there. It's close at the bottom too. Sheffield, Burnley and Everton all in trouble. Sheffield United bottom of the table. But 13 points now after that win for them. The first on the road last time out. Luton are just outside of the drop zone. But a little breathing room for Nottingham Forest either. In 16th place, just one clear of Luton Wolves in 11th position there. So much to look forward to on Team Talks tonight. We have Glenn Murray's two for two back to back Team Talks. Great to have you in the studio with us tonight. And then Darren Lewis. Who else but Darren Lewis? Yeah. Home from home for me. <laughs> Absolutely. Regular. That's, we're going to rename that seat the Darren Lewis seat. <laughs> um, unfortunately, we've got to start with some sad news. We obviously want to wish well to Roy Hodgson. Here is the official statement from Crystal Palace, the 76-year-old taken ill during training yesterday and rushed to hospital. Here's the statement following news that Roy Hodgson was taken ill during today's training session. We can confirm that he is now stable and is currently undergoing tests in hospital. Everybody at the club sends their best wishes to Roy for a speedy recovery. Everybody on Team Talks mm -hmm. as well, and here at Premier League Production, sends our best to Roy Hodgson for a speedy recovery. Right, we uh, are here looking forward to match week 25, mm. and that is the note we start on, but there is so much to come this weekend, including pretty rarely to have all three title contenders in action right through the spine of Saturday. <sighs> Yeah, um, tight, dramatic, tense. Um, I don't know how many adjectives I can come up with really <laughs> to describe the title race, but it is what we would want from the best league in the world because there are three consistent sides. One of them, Arsenal, the best defensively. The other, Liverpool, the best from an attacking point of view. And City, with the course, the distance, experience and the creativity, that's what makes it such a fantastic race. Okay. Yeah, I mean, Liverpool look first. They, they can retain top spot for the rest of the afternoon and relax. And I think that the one with the toughest task is the last game of the day. That's City and Chelsea. That is, that is the one that I think most people will be uh, logging in to, to watch. That is the, the, the clash of the day. Pretty sure we're going to be talking about that on the show tonight. <laughs> we do have plenty to get through on Team Talks tonight, including... Man City and Chelsea clash at the Etihad. The last time they faced off, it produced a Premier League classic. Luton suffered a shock loss to fellow strugglers Sheffield United, and now they tackle a resurgent Manchester United. 
Brentford got all three points from their trip to Molyneux. Next up, they host table topping Liverpool in West London. If you want to win at Brentford, you definitely have to be at your best. It's a really, really smart coached team. We start with that clash between Manchester City and Chelsea. We're going to hear from Pep Guardiola, followed by Maurizio Pochettino. He's already a, an exceptional, exceptional player. So he traveled or he moved on to get the minutes, the minutes that he has. And it just was a question of time and he showed his immense quality. He's playing really good. The last game he's playing really, really good. They have everything, it's intense and uh, the quality. and. Most of the teams define if they are able to don't lose the balls and it's difficult to find a player that can lose the balls and they're a really good team. Tough one tomorrow. I think the lesson is uh, that we are going to play and to face a very a very good team, one of the best in the world. But at the same time you need to be brave enough and to try to you know to force them to defend, to run backward, face to the, the goal. If only we go there and wait and see what is going on, I think it's a, it's a team that can dominate you and, and it's going to make suffer. The game you talked about is everybody's going to be watching in November for all at Stamford Bridge. Things have changed a little bit now. Do you think we could see a repeat of that game? I hope we see a repeat, but I doubt we see a repeat. This is much more difficult task for Chelsea, I think, going up to, to Manchester City. Manchester City, like we've talked about quite often, how they're just finding their groove. Uh, this is the business end of the season. Uh, De Bruyne back, Haaland back on track last weekend with a couple of goals. For me, uh, this is going to be a very, very difficult game for a Chelsea side. But things are progressing, Chelsea. Listen, if they did somehow get a result... They'll be sneaking into the European positions. Mm. Uh, no game next weekend, the following weekend, and then they've got a Carabao Cup. So if they could have silverware and be in the European positions, I think that is a project that is starting to come together. But it's a big if going away to Manchester City. You talked about Kevin De Bruyne. It just feels like City are getting into that gear where they are just unstoppable. They're different gravy at that point in time, and, and we're hitting that point in the season. De Bruyne has this amazing record in 2024. He's got assists in all of City's games. Mm. Four. Yeah. He hasn't even started all four. I know, but that's why he's the big kahuna. I mean, that is <laughs> one of the passes of the season. And it's so good that the finish is actually underrated. Cr criminally underrated. I mean, the big man here knows all about finishing, so I'll kind of leave that in your domain, Glenn. <laughs> but I, I just think when you have a Kevin De Bruyne to supply the ammunition, as a striker, it must feel just so... Well, you, you articulate it. Well, I think, I think in a lot of teams you make a lot of runs that don't get seen by players, or players that are maybe a little bit afraid to play that forward ball, don't want to put the ball at risk all the time, but you know when you're on a Kevin De Bruyne team. When you make that run, if it's the right one, he will more often than not find you. And right there, that's the stat that, mm. that, that matters a lot. And I think that is a scary stat because you've got to take into consideration they haven't really been fit in this opening no. in the first half of the season almost. I'm not, I'm not sure how many times they've actually played together, but I'm sure they'll be, uh, they'll be getting together a lot more in this second half and they'll be causing some devastation between the two of them. I think if, just to give you a, a couple of numbers around this, around about this time last year, City put together a run that saw them take 43 points from a possible 45 <laughs> to win the title. <laughs> It's, it's just ridiculous consistency. Deja vu. Deja vu, exactly. <laughs> and if you look at the Champions League, for example, in midweek, he scored his 15th Champions League goal. 12 of them are coming in knockout stages. That's when he lights up. That's when he, he turns into this force of nature, if you like, that is able to find any player in a goal-scoring position at any point of any game. Scary hours for the rest of the Premier League. Scary hours for Chelsea. Mm. We've got to face Manchester City at the Etihad, where they have been near perfect as well. Very difficult to go there. What do they expect? What does Mauricio Pochettino expect? Well, someone sat down with him this week. Someone on this couch, and it wasn't them. It was me. <laughs> Let's hear what he had to say. <laughs> We can be friends, no problem. Oh. I think it's a great opportunity for me to be back in the Premier League, for me, the, the best league in, in the world. <laughs> <laughs> There's a new boss in charge here at Stamford Bridge. It's a new season, it's a time to dream. Mauricio Pochettino will not believe this. Chelsea beaten at Stamford Bridge. Pochettino downs Spurs. What a game! He will feel he 
He's turning the corner. Chelsea look projected, demoralised. The booms ring out around Stamford Bridge. Perfect for Pochettino. It's another step up the ladder. Hi, how are you? Hello, Julia. how are you? Julia? Yeah, good, thank you. Big game, we brought the big lights. Yeah, very good. Very <laughs> <nice>. Good. <laughs> oh. You ready for the weekend? Yes. Yeah. Of course. You got a fantastic win on Monday nights. What did you enjoy most about that performance? I think it's the capacity to the team not to be great in the first half and, and to be a little bit flat and to change the registers and, and, and play really well and play in a similar way that we play again in the, on the FA Cup against Aston Villa. I think uh, the team is uh, getting better and is more mature now after seven months working. I think we are uh, uh, doing well with, the, with a young team that need to leave this type of uh, moment to, to grow. We talked about your fantastic win on Monday night, but a week before, it was the defeat at Wolves. Consistency is not something that you've enjoyed so far this season. What do you think that's down to, and how frustrating is it? Well, it's really frustrating because I've seen uh, <laughs> all the coaching staff, uh, the most difficult challenge is to create and to be a team that can be consistent no? every single game. Because our, our experience also, we know that when it's the team so young, when arriving summer, 15, 16, 17 players, always is going to, we are going to suffer this inconsistency. And yes, that is a challenge as soon as possible to be really consistent. A very exciting young group of players. Cole Palm is one that stands out. He's been a revelation in a Chelsea jersey. Did you expect him to do so well so soon? But it's difficult to talk about expectation no? when arrive a young guy in the last moment on the last day of the transfer uh, in summer. And I think always when we use sign players, always you expect that can perform. No? But it's true that uh, uh, it's a massive, you know, uh, boost for the team was from the beginning. He started to perform and he, you know, he was so uh, well adapting to the to the team and what the team need. And, and of course, uh, being honest, I think he's, he's doing fantastic. His former team, Manchester City, are coming up next this weekend, a big one. When you met last time in November, you gave us a Premier League Classic. It was fantastic to watch. Was that one of Chelsea's best performances of the season so far? I think so. I think so. I think we played really well. And I think it was um, a very good performance. 4-4, four, four. <laughs> great, uh, great performance from both teams. And it was an amazing game. Raheem Sterling! This has been a heavyweight encounter at the bridge. I uh, hope that we can repeat the same capacity to, uh, to perform again. And I think it's a good test for us because uh, we have the final in one week against Liverpool on, on Wembley. And I think it's going to be a, a fantastic test for us to see uh, if we can compete in this level at the moment. Good luck to you for that game and we look forward to seeing it. Thank you very much. Thank Pleasure. you. He also talked about Cole Palmer and admitted he did not expect him to do so well at Chelsea so soon. He's really been a revelation since switching from City. I think it's safe to stay in the billion pound they've spent. He's the best money they've spent without any doubt. I feel as though he has <clears throat> kept their season going at times. He's been the bright spark. Do you know what I think he's done really well? He's demanded of others and that's a really difficult thing to do for such a young man joining a big club. And yeah, he's been at, uh, at City, but he wasn't a household name, but it wasn't a regular city. So for him to be demanding of his teammates just shows what class he's in. Glenn, when you're in a team and a young player comes in and makes those demands, how does it go down with the more senior players? Well, how does it go down with the more senior players? Uh, I think if it's done in the right manner, it's all right, but you've got to think that there's not many senior players in this group. Mm. That is, so he's actually taking, I, I suppose, the lead and, and he wants to be the one that people look to and he yeah. wants to drive the team forward. So he is becoming the leader of that team, even though he's, he's young in, in, in his years. I think his experiences and, 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 and what he wants to do in the game is, is, is sort of stamping his authority. I mean, when you look at that team, there's only really Thiago Silva. Yeah. He's nowhere near him. So up at the top end of the field, he's got to take, take the lead and, and, and take the team on. And without doubt, with his goals and assists, that's what he's done so far. I think the point you're making about the leadership reflects in the inconsistency 
that we're seeing. You just don't know. Will you see Chelsea that lost to Wolves at Stamford Bridge or will mm. you see Chelsea that won at Palace on Monday night? I think tomorrow you're going to see the Chelsea that lost at Wolves. Manchester City's record at home, they are near invincible across all competitions. You might take them down away from home, but at the Etihad, they're undefeated since November 2022. That's when... because of the atmosphere at the Etihad, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh, <laughs> savage. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but a little bit about the quality. And if you mix in the fact that Pochettino has only won one of his last 12 meetings against Guardiola, a Spurs boss, an Espanyol boss, he just can never get the better mm. of Guardiola. And I even think tomorrow might be a little bit of a difficult day for uh, Cole Palmer because he came from the City Academy. They know his game so well. They will have seen that he was able to rise up a level at Stamford Bridge. They'll be ready for him in this particular match. And I think if you add to that the resurgence of Haaland, the point to prove that De Bruyne has. Uh, Stones, the three of them were in the same team for the first time since the Champions League final last June in midweek. It's all coming together for City and I just think they're going to be way too strong for Chelsea tomorrow. How scary is the thought that De Bruyne and Haaland have had time out and heading into the final stretch of the season now are back? and are back doing those, putting up those numbers we just saw earlier? Well, well they're fresh. Um, but, but the thing that struck me a, a lot, less about... Well, maybe b both of them, because the finish, and, and again, you know all about the finish, but 70 minutes in the Everton game, Haaland was frustrated. And yet, mm -hmm. he gets an opportunity, and he, he hits a shot so hard he could have taken Pickford's hand off. With De Bruyne... It, I look at the ferocity of his goal celebrations. He is a guy who's come back with a lot of frustration, having missed so much football since the opening weekend of the Premier League season. So he's back at this stage, really ready to rumble and not just make goals, but score goals, as he has done as well. I think this is going to be a huge game, but I think it's going to be a statement win from City, I really do. We're well, moving on now to the action at Kenilworth Road, where Luton take on Manchester United. Let's hear from both managers, starting with Rob Edwards. It's a really exciting few weeks ahead for us now, playing United and then Liverpool at Anfield in quick succession, quickly followed up by Manchester City in the FA Cup. You know, it's um, some exciting fixtures coming up for us. Um, but yeah, it, it does, doesn't it? I mean, ten years to be um, in ten years to be doing that, to have done that, it's really special. And a lot of people deserve a lot of credit. I'm really lucky to be here at this moment. It's not up to me. It's um, I'm working, and that is my focus point in this moment on this team. And yeah, we plan in this construction what we have now in the club, in this organisation for the future. So. We have a look and now we closed at the window in January. We are working on the plans for the summer. Manchester United have found some form lately, but we do have a graphic for you that shows a comparison between this season and last season. And uh, the numbers will show you that Manchester United are worse off at this point than they were last season in almost every important sector there. Goals scored. Uh, games lost, they've lost more, they've drawn less though. Um, position, points collected and goals conceded as well. It's not really surprising. No, it isn't surprising, those stats there. Um, I think the only thing that, that sort of skews your judgment is their recent form. They've, yeah. they've found a little bit of consistency, which has been Ten Hag and Manchester United's problem throughout his tenure at the football club. Um, whether they're moving in the right direction is still very questionable for me. Um, I think they will finish in a European place, not not a Champions League, but a European place. Um, yeah, I, I'm just not sure exactly where they go from this point, whether they stick with Ten Hag, whether they move on. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the numbers, they yeah. speak volumes. Uh, um, it, it's not good enough for a club of Manchester United stature, where they want to be fighting, the money they've spent... Um, yeah, it's going to be... I mean, there's a lot There's a lot of movement behind the scenes at Manchester mm. United. Dan Ashworth is supposedly meant to be leaving Newcastle, maybe. Uh, so there's a restructuring there with Ineos taking over. It looks like it's going to be a lot more organised behind the scenes and not such a scattergun approach, which will, which will definitely help the manager. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm very interested to see how Manchester United plays out. Darren, I know that you know about the restructuring. I know you could probably give us some more insight into it and how the changes are going to happen. 
Well, I think the, the, the transfer policy has to be a lot better, a lot more joined up. There's got to be less emphasis on trying to get um, stellar names, uh, A-listers with a big commercial uh, pull and more pieces that fit together better. If you look at the Liverpool and the City sides, they're well constructed um, and, and they're a side of moving parts, but temperaments that interlock and, and leaders as well in that team as well for when the going gets tough. I don't see that in the Manchester uh, United side, for example. If you look at Bruno Fernandes, most of his yellow cards come either on half-time or just after half-time when he's moaning at the referee because he's not getting what United want. As far as I'm a is concerned, he's come in to oversee uh, a more holistic approach, which City were actually derided for when they talked about wanting that kind of approach when uh, Chiki Bergeristan and Soriano arrived at the club, but that's worked superbly well for them, and that's the kind of thing they want at Manchester United. I've always said that the problem for Manchester United will not be solved by more players coming in. It will be solved by a change of culture. Mm. And I, I'm not sure that Ten Hag will be there to oversee that culture, as you've been suggesting. I don't know what his future is. Because that run of form you mentioned right at the top of this conversation, four wins in a row, that's the first time this season they've put together such a run. And that's not good enough for a size of that, that calibre. They can score goals, and they will probably score goals this weekend. But can they keep goals out? I don't think they can. And the big problem for Ten Hag is that there are no consequences for poor performance at Manchester United. At City, at Arsenal, at Liverpool, to a certain extent, maybe Chelsea, if you're not playing well, you're out of the side. At United, you get another game. And that sea of mediocrity is what they're trying to change with the acquisition of Barada and, obviously, with the... Well, they haven't got him yet. Yeah, Probably better not go too far, but with Ashwa. Those four wins in a row in all competitions that both of you have mentioned now, driven largely by Rasmus Hoyland's form. Scott McTominay also, the unlikely late goal hero of United a couple of times this season. Yeah, more often than what probably Manchester United would like. Um, as far as I'm concerned, Rasmus Hoyland, I think he's been in the right place at the right time on a number of occasions. He's just not been surprised for. And we see McTominay coming on very late, wins late winners, uh, headers are right. He, he arrives in the box. There's a big conversation if he, if he should start for Manchester United. And I think a, a large proportion of why they're doing so well is they've got quite a nice balance in midfield at the minute with the youngster Maynou in there with Casemiro and Fernandez just in front of them. But the difference is that when Fernandez, uh, sorry, when um, McTominay comes off the bench, he's something different. And I don't think if, if he started the game, any of the others would offer the same impact. So at the minute, I think that has really helped Ten Hag and Manchester United. But without doubt, I mean, you, you can't question them. Four wins on the spin, it's really good. And they've got a really good opportunity to make it six with Luton and Fulham in the next couple of games. Yeah, very quickly, Darren, the um, challenge that they do face against Luton Town. Kenilworth Road has been a difficult place to go. I don't think many of us saw, and I don't even think that Glenn in his predictions last week said that Sheffield United would be beating Luton. Mm. They did. Yeah, and that's probably the worst thing for Man United because there, maybe there was a bit of complacency from those Luton players. But so far this season, Luton reminded me of uh, the kind of team that goes to a new school, bigger school, and someone takes their lunch money in the first few days and they go away, they hit the gym. <laughs> <laughs> Come back. That's a nice analogy. Try that one again. <laughs> they've taken points of Liverpool. I never imagined that would have happened. And they took a point off Liverpool. They um, beat Newcastle home and away. Uh, Arsenal needed a late, yeah. late, late, late winner to see them off. City had to deep, deep to see them off as well. I look at the inconsistency in the United side and I just wonder if that defeat to Sheffield United might well have galvanised the Liverpool mm. players and they'll turn up tomorrow. And Rob's been saying in his uh, press conference, we're going on the front foot. Let's see what happens. Mm, so much to look forward to, including Spurs, who have won their last five home games in a row. And Wolves have found a bit of form on the road. We look forward to their battle when we return. <laughs> Welcome back to Team Talks. Tottenham and Wolves do battle in the Premier League on Saturday. Let's hear from both managers, Ange Postacoglu and Gary O'Neill. 
we started the season strong and then obviously we had some some challenges kind of through that middle period that we handled it not too bad um you know obviously the results weren't great but our sort of competitive levels were, were still decent through that time and it's about finishing the season strong i don't think it's any different to any other team um you can have sort of specific targets but ultimately if we can finish the season strong we'll, we'll be in a decent position Tottenham at full strength or close to full strength will be a real test for us as it is for everybody that goes there. So, um, yeah, I think as in, in any Premier League game, especially away against the bigger sides, you know that you're going to need to be at 100% and everything's going to need to be as close to perfect as we can get it, like like we were at, at Stamford Bridge. Um, and we'll do our best to do that and then um, see if we can make it an uncomfortable day for Tottenham. Darren. <laughs> <laughs> the um, South Korean derby here with uh, Son Young Min mm -hmm. and uh, Hwang Hee Chan mm -hmm. in focus. That's what they call it, the South Korean derby. Mm -hmm. What are we looking forward to most in this game and in the battle between those two? Well, uh, they're both... <laughs> it's interesting because with Wolves, they've won each of their last three against Spurs. But Spurs have won each of their last five home games. Um, in fact, the only team with a better home run, home run so far this season, Liverpool, uh, with ten to Tottenham's nine. Uh, so they both know how to score goals, right? And, and, and I'm throwing lots of numbers, but they're all significant because uh, uh, both teams have these talisman, uh, talismen who know where the goal is regardlessly, regardless of what's going on during the match. And I think as far as Son is concerned, he's either scoring goals or he's involved in goals. Um, and I think with Huang, he's really benefited from adapting to the Premier League, uh, from his team adapting to him. Uh, his composure in the final third is absolutely fantastic. And he's playing full of confidence. Now, I almost feel I should not be speaking here because I'm sitting next to a guy yeah. who knows how to score goals. Take it away, Glenn. No, I, I just think Juan is really benefited from Gary O'Neill. This is a Wolves team that have struggled to score goals over a number of seasons. In fact, if they score a couple at Tottenham at the weekend, they'll have surpassed their, their record for the last three years mm. with 13 games remaining. So it just shows what a different sort of, um, I suppose tactics, uh, a different belief that Gary O'Neill's installed. And let's not forget, this was a Wolves side that people were tipping for relegation. Absolutely. So I, I think I think what the manager's done and, and the players, and obviously they, they'll be a little bit disappointed because I, I don't think Cooney is fit, but Juan is, so it, it, it'll be a like-for-like -like change, I imagine. But they will go there, and Gary O'Neill will, will want a reaction after last weekend. He'll be very disappointed getting beat by uh, Brentford at home. Mm -hmm. And do you know what? He says that it's difficult to go to Spurs. It really is. But do you know what? If you can just get that third-man runner right, because Spurs play such a hard line, a high line, then they, I think they will go there with a little bit of belief. Yeah, Huang Hee Chan with 10 goals in 20 appearances in the Premier League. And Son, what more do you want to say about him? Everybody loves him and he's come back and just reminded everyone his importance to this Tottenham team. Yeah, Tottenham right now are on an incredible run of 36 matches in which they've scored. Only one other team has a better record. Uh, which is Arsenal. They've yeah, got a lo long way to go, haven't they, to yeah, that? Got a long way to go. <laughs> and it's since that. failing to score against Wolves in March. 1-0 they lost, and since then they've scored in every now, game. Now, the fascinating thing is we started this season worrying about how they're going to get the goals without Harry Kane. But I think there's a real theme in today's show about underrated players. You've already talked about Scott McTominay. I think Pascal Gross will get to him at Brighton's really underrated. Gary O'Neill's an underrated manager. He's done a superb job, given that June and Lopetegui felt he couldn't take Wolves forward. And, and it's mutual parting of the ways. Son Hyung min is massively, massively underrated. The best thing I could say about him, and I'm sure you would agree with this, Glenn, he could play for any team, bar none, in the Premier League. That's how good he is. Um, and I know that's a, quite a call, but I just think he's versatile. Do, do you want to... I, I think in the world. I'm surprised like Real or someone haven't come knocking mm. for him. I think he's been outstanding. He's been in the shadow of Kane for, for so so long, but every time Kane was ever injured, mm. some would step up and he's only had one really 
mixy season, a little bit of an off yeah. season last last year, but under Ange, it looks like he's back to his best. And again, it's as you were saying before, confidence that you get from the manager, that belief in your ability to score goals and that you can fit into whatever tactical configuration you come up with because there's leadership from him as captain. There's versatility from him. You put him anywhere, he will give you an honest day's work. And then you've got that composure in the final third. There's such an appreciation for where other players are in the team as they attack. And he always seems to play the right way or pass if he plays somebody else in. He's a fabulous footballer. This is going to be some game. Um, I know we'll do the predictions later on, but th these two are going to be at the centre of everything. Good. <laughs> now, I know numbers and stats are your business, but if you will allow me, a stat that I found fascinating about Son Hyung min is that his goals and assists have been worth 16 points to Tottenham this season. That's phenomenal. That's the action in North London on Saturday. But elsewhere in West London, to kick us off for the weekend, it's at the GTEC Community Stadium where Brentford host Liverpool. Let's hear from the managers, Thomas Frank, then Jurgen Klopp. Uh, I think they are the, the best offensive team in the league because I think they are very difficult to close down uh, when they're on it because they play behind. They play crosses, they combine, they do one ones they are good on set pieces, they, they, they're good at everything offensively. And I also see, I think you can see they, they create the, the most XG that, that's completely aligned or linked to, to the, the way they, they play offensive on, on, the, on the last uh, third of the, the pitch. Super tricky there. Um, the way to play and the way to set it up um, with or without Tony makes a difference. All the guys back from the African Cup of Nations makes a difference. Mopai found his feet makes a difference. If you want to win at Brentford, you definitely have to be at your best. It's a really, really smart coached team. A really smart coached team. Jurgen Klopp's going to have to be smart because he's missing some key players. We know that Trent Alexander-Arnold is out of mm -hmm. contention, in fact, with the knee injury. We're hearing, unconfirmed though, that Alisson may be in doubt as well. We know he missed out due to illness last time, but now there's an injury concern. Um, it's just at this point of the season, some reshuffling, but these are big games. They're all big games, and especially considering that Liverpool haven't won at Brentford. Huge game, away from home, opening opening uh, fixture of the weekend. Everyone will be watching, even the other clubs and players, as they as they have their pre-match. Do um, you watch the early game? I always thought they... Well, if you don't watch it, you look on your phone at it, don't you? <laughs> 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 so they'll be, they will be aware of, of what's happening. Um, and in all fairness to Brentford, uh, I think they've probably underperformed to, to what they expected this season. But, listen, you can't, you can't replace Ivan Toney in the six mm. months that he missed. I mean, goals at, at, at that level, um, uh, they're very, very hard yeah. to come by. But they are in a position that they like to be in. They're the underdog, they're plucky, they're brave, and they will have a real go. Them, the first, the first 11, the substitutes, even the fans will make it a real fortress. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm interested to find out what happens with this one. Ivan Tony, three goals in four games since his return. Important, as you mentioned. But his partnership with Neil Mopé has also been fascinating mm. to watch, exciting. Yeah, lots of goal involvements in all of the last, what, six games that yeah. they've played. I think there's been four goals and a couple of assists. And he seems to have really exploded into life for the arrival of Tony. Like you say, three goals in, the, in four games since he's come back. They're doing their job. And I think as well, as far as uh, Mopé is concerned, and I'll just bring you in, uh, uh, Glenn. <laughs> I think he loves ruffling feathers. A lot of people have talked about the bust-ups that he's been involved in. I actually think that's part of his game. Mm. I think he loves getting hackles up. I always remember covering a game involving Deli Alley when he played for Spurs, and um, lots of people used to wag their fingers metaphorically at him when he'd get involved in scrapes. And we interviewed um, Pochettino um, afterwards, not in the, the main press conference, but in a side room. And he said, I love it when he's a little bit naughty. I love that about him. <laughs> And I, I, I wonder if it, these goals and assists and abilities to influence games that he has come up with, they coincide with this real kind of... There's a word I need to use, but I can't use it. <laughs> that fire, some people, some people need that kind of fire. I don't think Glenn was one of them, and thank you for not using the word on TV. Thank you. Um, but that fire that he, that he has, we've seen it in his celebrations um, against Spurs, the cheeky tweets afterwards, that was not in your personality? 
that's not something you needed to be hyped? No, I don't think so, no. OK. Well, are you going to run something? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very cautious with my answer there. I know, you know. I know we have a reputation for it, but we, we ain't got nothing on you. He's a cool you. kind of fellow, cool You did mellow. have a reaction, though, when we were showing the Neil Morpé stuff. What was that about? Oh, no, it was it just... He it, it does rub people up the wrong way. And, and I do think there is players in, in Premier League history and football history. I mean, Robbie Savage was, was a master at it. And, and it just seems to throw people off their game a little bit and, and he seems to benefit off that. But I do think that, that since Ivan Tony has been back, they seem to have forged a really nice relationship. I think it's probably one where he irritates people and Ivan Tony can just benefit off the back of that. Talking about firepower, though, you don't need to look any further than Liverpool. You've already mentioned it, I think, Darren, at the top of the show, that Liverpool, from an attacking perspective, just have one of the best, certainly in that title race discussion. And they have a number of options. One of them, perhaps Mo Salah, mm. who we think might be back in action. Jota stepped up brilliantly in his absence. Um, yeah, just Liverpool, from an attacking point of view, could be a lot for Brentford. Well, there had been this mythology that they were reliant solely on Salah, but in six, uh, they were winners of six of their eight games since Salah last played. And in that run, scored 22 goals. Well, so they'd have won eight with him, wouldn't they? Eight uh, eight. <laughs> <laughs> Fair point, well made. <laughs> uh, but... The, the... <laughs> <laughs> no, they, they, they actually they do really well without him. Just in, in history, everyone jumps to that conclusion, don't Absolutely. they? But they, they, they do really well without him. They can, do. Please, I... can you let Darren finish the sentence, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> no, listen, Glenn's right. He, 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 you know, listen, if you're going to win a title, you do need somebody with that class and quality. But yeah. they do have the ability to step up, show leadership, score goals, and find that composure in the final third, which has kept them at the top of the Premier League. All right, we've got to move on now, though, because Sheffield United <laughs> claimed their first win on the road this season. They're back home against Brighton this weekend. We focus on that after the break. Previewing match week 25 in the Premier League here on Team Talks tonight. It all gets underway with Brentford's clash against Liverpool. A lunchtime, tasty little lunchtime uh, feast on the menu there, we hope. Burn, burn the Arsenal. Hors d'oeuvre. Fancy words there. <laughs> Burnley Arsenal kicks off at the same time as Tottenham Wolves and a whole bunch of other games there. Fulham, Aston Villa as well. Man City <laughs> versus Chelsea is uh, the main course, would you say? Very cool. Yeah, we got some desserts on Sunday. Luton versus Manchester United and then Dessert. Everton versus Cre Two desserts. Everton versus Crystal Palace on Monday night. Yeah, there's plenty coming in midweek as well. Man City versus Brentford and Liverpool versus Luton on Tuesday and Wednesday. First up, though, we're going to talk about Sheffield United versus Brighton. Let's hear from Chris Wilder. This should be a feel-good factor around the place, of course. You know, we'd rather have it that way than the, than the mood and the feeling of, of what it was like after the Villa game. Of course, the run comes uh, with the next big performance and result, and we need another big performance and result. It's a really difficult game, we understand that. It's, it's got its different um, different problems that maybe, I would say, you know, three-quarters of the Premier League games have. Um, and it's one that you have to get absolutely spot on if you, if you, uh, if you want to get that result. That match at Bramall Lane on Sunday, Sheffield United surprised most of us, I think, by beating Luton. Yes, they did. Um, you I, don't sound convinced. Did you predict that Sheffield United were going to beat Luton? You know I didn't, Jules. <laughs> but I, when, when you look at the fixtures, this is one that they would have internally believed that they could win, even though everything was going well for, for Luton. Um, and it keeps Sheffield United in touching, dis, uh, mm. touch, touching distance of, of Premier League safety. Um, I think this weekend could be quite difficult for Brighton. They beat Sheffield United at Bramble Lane 5-2 in the FA Cup only a matter of weeks ago. I think it'll be a much more difficult game for Brighton this, this weekend. And there will be a little bit of belief in that Sheffield United squad that another win and all of a sudden you can smell safety. Because mm, that's the nature of the Premier League. It is so congested all over. And that suddenly changed the picture for them a little bit, where most people have written them off already. Yeah. And uh, to be fair, with some justification, they, they cannot stop conceding goals. 
um, and even in that victory they conceded. I think they've conceded the most goals mm. of, any, of any team at this stage of a Premier League season. Um, and the last time they did concede this many goals, they went down. But the belief is still there, and that's what's all important if you're in a situation like the one they find themselves. And they've got Chris Wilder, he's an excellent communicator, he's a good motivator as well. So this will give them heart. Strangely enough, Brighton's run against Sheffield United recently is not great. No, it's really not in the league. Me. No, not in the no. league. I don't, why do you think that is? I think you just come across so, some clubs like that, don't you? Uh, I think the the opposing fixture earlier on in the season, Brighton were really disappointed. They were, they were in control of it, didn't put it to bed. And if you don't put Premier League teams to bed, then they will come back and yeah. bite you. And Sheffield United did that. Yeah, I'm sorry again, Darren, to impose on your title here as the stats <laughs> master. But it is uh, unbeaten in their last seven games versus Brighton. What do you think Brighton have to do to change that? Brighton need to bring a lot of energy to the game, I think, and, and, and be clinical with the ball. They need to, to, to have high possession, um, but not let Sheffield United sit back and, and just protect their goal. They need to, to move the ball quickly and, and, and disjoint them. And, and ultimately, you're playing against a Sheffield United team. Like Darren says, that they've left 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 the most goals in at this stage, mm. so confidence will be low because as as footballers, they are stats that you do not want to be hanging over your head. So I think uh, it's all about Brighton and how they try and break down Sheffield United. But Sheffield United will be they'll be a little bit more resolute, I think, than than previous weeks, and 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 that belief, like I say, will be growing. And Chris Wilder, like Dan said, is an expert in that field. I'm going to stick with you for this Brighton question because uh, if they are to break down Sheffield United, you'd assume that Pascal Gross is going to be involved somehow. Yes, somehow, whether it's right back, centre midfield, middle of the ten, <laughs> I'm not exactly sure where, but he will be involved, yes. Uh, someone who lose by example every weekend, uh, very underappreciated. I actually think he's got the, the second most big chances behind Kevin De Bruyne since he's been in the Premier League. So that just shows what an influence he has got in the Germany squad as well. So anything good that comes at Sheffield United, I'm sure he'll have a, have a part to play. Nine goals in his last 11 league starts for Brighton. I'm sorry, Darren. <laughs> uh, it's time now to hear from all the managers ahead of Match Week 25. Let's whoop around the Premier League. You get a punishment, you take the punishment. That's kind of how I look at it. Um, and in the end, I'm too focused now on, 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 on the squad, on the team. I said I don't prioritise the individual right now. We have to prioritise the team and the collective. And therefore, I, you know, I, I, can't, I can't dwell on it too much. We move on. No, it's really positive, the, the, I, the mood during this week, because we, we have had um, last two months, December busy period and January busy period, uh, with a lot of injuries, a lot of players um, not available, with three players in the African Cup in really two important months for us. Um, December month was a positive one last last January as well, but we had uh, not just Premier League, two different competitions. Of course, with our squad um, completed, we are stronger, no doubts about it. Our challenge is against Newcastle. Our challenge is against Sheffield. Our challenge is against Manchester United. Our challenge is tomorrow against Aaron Fulham. And always preparing the match, respecting them, and uh, always trying to, to face them, uh, analyzing them with their best performances, with their best qualities. And then we have to try to, to face them with ours. When you're in that role, I think you need longevity to actually see the fruits of your labour. It's, it's sort of a long-term position. And I think the people that have done it best in the Premier League um, throughout time have always had a period of real stability and able to... Because change takes a long time in any football club to um, get those processes exactly how you want them to be. So, uh, you know, Dan's had a, a relatively short time here. So um, but let's see what happens. As I say, as I sit here now, nothing's happened. We will need goals tomorrow because Newcastle is a really, really offensive power. You see the last games, they score, they score three, they score four, then they, they, the game before, another three, the game before. So they are scoring a lot of goals. So it's not going to be easy for us not to, not to concede. They are a good team and the table shows that um, what happened before for sure will be a reaction. Um, but we're going to face a good team with good players, good manager. We know how hard it is to play West Ham, but we, we have to focus on ourselves and the moment requires. 
that uh, we must do better so we can win the game. We're all in it together. We're going to act as if it's a blip. We're going to work in, take the next game. We've had some great results. We've had a poor result. So we need to bounce back. We need to show it. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the attitude of the players, their commitment with the show. Uh, it always it always shows you a little bit about your club, and I think in the main, the players here have been very, very good. All right, we've said the uh, three top three are all in action on Saturday, but we haven't yet talked about Arsenal. They go to Burnley mm. after um, I predicted last week that they were going to draw <laughs> against West Ham, and then they won. It wasn't me. They won six 0 If you're going to go wrong, <laughs> go big. <laughs> what do we think about that game of turf, Mark? Uh, well, Burnley don't score enough goals and Arsenal score lots of them, more than people think. Also, they have the best defensive record in the Premier League. I think this is going to be a, a, another a morale-boosting away win for Arsenal. That means that West Ham need a big reaction after losing it's by such a big margin. They go to Forest, another tricky one. Yes, very tricky. Forest, right on the cusp of, of that relegation zone, <coughs> need, need a victory. Um, and like you say, West Ham and David Moyes will definitely expect a reaction after getting slapped 6-0. And I was the one that said it was going to be a draw just. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to say anything. I, just said, I said me, I took the name. What do you think about Burnley versus Arsenal? I think this is the time that Mikel Arteta's men need to get down to business. I personally still don't think we've seen the very best of Arsenal mm. that we saw last season in, in that running. So... I, I think that Mikel Arteta and his players will expect to get better and better. And, and it all just seems to be fitting into place. Martinelli coming back into form, Trossard firing from the bench, Saka back on form, Odegaard starting to pull the strings. I think things are looking quite good at Arsenal at the moment. Cue, cue them losing this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> the other game I think that uh, stands out there is Fulham versus Aston Villa, just looking uh, at that one. And what interests you about that fixture? Well, they started scoring goals again. They were scoring goals for fun and then they went on a run of around about five, six weeks where they couldn't hit a barn door. Uh, but the confidence appears to have come back in the side. And um, as far as they are concerned, they are a tough place to go. Villa, near invincible. Villa Park, but away from home, nowhere near as good. They're falling out of the top four places. I think they're kind of blowing up a bit, although I have to be fair to them. They've had four ACLs, Konsa, Camera, Mings. Who's the other one? Uh, there was another one who picked up an ACL as well. Unamari's had horrendous luck as far as that's concerned. I did think maybe they could have added in the window just to give themselves a bit of depth. Um, but I think as far as Villa are concerned, I, I think this could be a difficult day for them and the film might come out on top. It's time now for your favourite parts of Team Talks. It's prediction time. We are putting Darren and Glenn to the ultimate test, seeing if they can get the call right for all 10 Premier League fixtures. And we're starting, Glenn, with you. Brentford versus Liverpool. Brentford 1, Liverpool 3. I've got... Exactly along with You can't that. copy me all the way through. I can't do it all the way through. <laughs> Give me one or two. Give me one or two. Well, let's start with you then, so Darren. No, no, I'll pig piggyback me through. <laughs> <laughs> Darren, starting with you, on the spot first. OK. Burnley versus Arsenal. Oh, no, Burnley nil. I think this could be quite comprehensive. Arsenal four. Really? Yeah. I agree. Ah, no, that's, that's, annoying, that's annoying me, that, really, because yeah, I, I expect you to say two or three, but four, well, yeah, I'm going big as well, four. Yeah. And you don't think Burnley will score? Nope. Right. Fulham versus Aston Villa. Fulham Villa, I think Villa will get back on it and Villa will win 2 1. OK. What do you well, think? No, I think Fulham will win this one. Uh, the confidence is high. Villa don't like going to London. Um, and they will leave a few gaps in defence. I think it will be 2 1 Fulham. Let's stick with you, Darren. Start Newcastle versus Bournemouth. Uh, Bournemouth. Uh, Better now than people have given them credit for yeah. under Iriola. They've earned that respect. Newcastle, however, are strong at home. I wonder if they might be unsettled by this whole Ashworth thing around them. Callum Wilson also now missing for the rest of the season. Um, I think this could be a draw. I'm going to go 1 1. Well, Eddie Howe has never beaten his old club, I don't think, in the Premier League. I'm going to go for him to break his duck this, this weekend, and I am going to go for a Newcastle win 2 1. <laughs> 
here on Team Talks, we like to leave the stats to Darren. OK? Ah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Nottingham Forest versus... I'll have to hold you to a pass. <laughs> Nottingham, <laughs> Nottingham Forest versus West Ham. Predictions? Nottingham Forest, West Ham. West Ham 2-1. Yeah, I think uh, David Moyes' position, sadly, might rely on this one. And I think, really? Yeah, I, I think there is a... A growing undercurrent of dissatisfaction, particularly given the, the, the scale of last week's defeat to Arsenal. Um, but I am hoping that the players, I do know they've got a lot of belief in what Moyes can do, and I think they'll respond. I think West Ham will win 2-1. Tottenham versus Wolves? Home win for Tottenham, uh, because they're so strong, and Wolves, they'll, they'll make a fight of it, but Spurs win 2-1. 3-1 Spurs for me, I think, I think Spurs will keep that momentum going. Man City versus Chelsea. Manchester City, four. Chelsea, two. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you nearly got us. <laughs> what do you think, Darren? Um, I, I think I'm going to go one goal fewer. I think it'll be edgier, three, two to City. Right, then on Sunday's action, Sheffield United versus Brighton. Oh, that's going to be easy for Brighton on this occasion. I think United... Uh, I'll just tell you. Uh, United, nil. Brighton, two. What I'm going for a 3-1 victory to visit as Brighton. Luton Town, Manchester United, what's your prediction? <sighs> this prediction. is a tough one. This is a tough one. I'm going to go for the underdog. I'm going to go for a plucky Luton 2-1 victory. Ooh. Do you know what? I'm going to go along with that. That's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> I, 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 listen, I've said many times on Great the show, lines and you, all do, you cannot trust Manchester United. I've said it on Kelly and Wright's show as well. I'll say it here as well on my spiritual home. Did you just say great minds? You know they say fools. Anyway, oh, uh, Everton, wow. versus, <laughs> Everton versus Crystal Palace, Darren. It's the last one. This one tough so Everton. the best to last. Yeah, absolutely. Um, home win for Everton. Uh, I'm going to go 2-0. 1-0 Everton. OK. You can tell us why? I just think at home they'll be resolute. I think Crystal Palace struggle for goals a little bit. They'll struggle for guidance. Manager's not there. I think Sean Dyche's men will just get over the line on that. Game we are most looking forward to this weekend. Man City, Chelsea. Agreed. All right, it's a bumper weekend in the Premier League coming up. Match week 25. <laughs> we have teed it up. All that's left is the action. Thank you so much to Darren. Thank you to Glenn. Thank you to all of you for joining us and to our team behind the scenes. Enjoy the football. <laughs>